Well, today is a, a bit of a special message uh, from Habakkuk chapter 2. It's a message that uh, God, even preparing for this, had, had weighed heavily upon my heart, felt the presence of the Lord in a special way. I don't always feel that as I'm preparing for the message, but when it comes, uh, it is a great blessing, and I know that there's been a lot of warfare, a lot of difficulty this week because of this message. Satan does not want you to hear God's word, especially the men of this church. Um, and you'll remember that a long time ago we had a message on about the three chairs. Today it's going to be about the four chairs. And we're going to see there's some similarities and, and also some differences between uh, these four chairs and what they represent this morning. But they are quite important for each and every one of us to take home, realizing that church is not about just hearing a message and, and feeling uh, rewarded or feeling good about myself or about my Sunday, about my week, and then going home the same. God truly wants to change our hearts and lives through the preached word of God. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to commit this time to you and asking you that you, through your Holy Spirit, Lord, enlighten and illuminate all of our hearts and our minds. You take away distractions. You take away any anxieties, any weights or shames or burdens or guilt that may be weighing upon anyone in this moment that they would be able to surrender those to you and place them under the blood of Jesus, your son. Father, I pray that all the words out of my mouth would be from you and not me, that you would, Father, powerfully use your truth to penetrate our hearts and lives, to transform us, Lord, as we are in desperate need of your grace. We are sinners broken and fragile, but, Lord, by your power we move and we continue and we are strengthened by your grace and by your spirit. We pray, Lord, that you greatly use this time in your power and in your love, Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this message you'll see in your bulletin on the screen is about vision. Vision for you as a man, as a husband, as a father. Vision for you also as a, as a woman and vision for our children. <clears throat> this vision comes through true leaders. And sadly, in our society today and in our churches, we do not have very many leaders. We have a lot of chaplains, but very few leaders. And the leaders we do have most of whom are very passive and very inept. They are not masculine men. Most pastors are not masculine men. And I, I'm, I am hoping that you're going to see by the end of this message that you should not ever, if I were to pass away tonight, God forbid, that you would never ever follow a pastor, a, le- a spiritual leader that is not a masculine man, but a man that follows true convictions and hears the voice of the God, has a vision for his life and for his, his family and for the church, and for the society around him. And that is what we see in the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk is in the minor prophets, and they're called minor not because they're less than the major prophets or not as important, but they're minor prophets because they're smaller books of prophecy. And in this chapter, chapter 2 of Habakkuk, 1 through 4, your bulletins say 1 through 3, excuse the mistake I made, it's 1 through 4, of Habakkuk chapter 2, you will see what real vision looks like in the process of receiving that vision from the Lord. What does that entail? And why uh, our society and our churches are in the positions they're in spiritually because we do not have vision from God in our hearts and lives. We follow status quo. We follow what other so-called evangelicals are doing. And if it's the accepted norm, if it's the status quo, then that's what I'm going to do in my life. It's acceptable. The, the difficulty of that is most of the time it's unacceptable with God. But when people are the objective, pleasing man, then the pleasing of man becomes the goal. That becomes the false vision of our lives, and we greatly displease God, and we grieve his spirit. People are not blessed, and people are going down even faster on the road to perdition. Vision is everything. Without a vision, Proverbs says, the people perish. This vision comes from hearing the voice of God through his word. Habakkuk 2 verse 1 says this, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Amen? 
What does watchman mean? It is a word, word used all throughout the book of Ezekiel as the watchman of Israel, the priests, the prophets, they were to over, uh, they were to protect the well-being and the welfare of Israel spiritually. And sadly, in the book of Ezekiel, it is a strong rebuke of those watchmen who fail to do their task. But Habakkuk is not failing in his task. He is a watchman. He's a spiritual protector over Israel in the middle of a very dark time. Remember, the Assyrians are over them at this time, oppressing them. And soon God will raise up the Babylonians to crush the Assyrians and continue on the captivity of Israel. Habakkuk is writing in, in between that time, around 600 B.C., 600 plus years before Christ. He is weighted down. He is burned down. He is confused. He feels lonely. And he feels oppressed. He is waiting for the voice of God, and finally God speaks to him, and this is God's answer to the dilemma. God, when are you going to respond? We have gone so long. There is so much suffering, so much injustice, so much oppression. Where is your answer? And there is a false spirituality that predominates all of evangelicalism, that it is wrong to give your complaints before God. I'm not talking about asking God why. I'm talking about legitimate complaints. Those are pleasing to God, and God always wants men to speak to him as men. How many of you watched The Fiddler on the Roof? An older movie, but mostly probably older adults that have seen that movie, and it shows so accurately Jewish culture and how God wants to speak us to speak to him. You see it in King David. You see it in the book of Job. They bring their complaints before God. That is true honesty. That is true godliness. To have fake spiritual prayers is not pleasing to God when I am trying to act like someone that I'm really not. Something is really bothering me. And I have a complaint, and I need to bring that before God, and, and I don't do it because of a false spirituality. All of us know when someone is praying in a false spirituality, amen? You should know. You should have that discernment to know this person is way off. They're saying the evangelical Christian words, but they are nowhere near probably being a true Christian. And I, by the way, and you need to understand why I preach the way I do, Paul is very clear in Corinthians, we are to judge those inside the church, amen? Not outside the church. We don't judge the pagans, they're pagans. They're unbelievers. Unbelievers do what unbelievers do, amen? They will get drunk, they will take drugs, they will take, be in premarital sex, That is the norm. That is what pagan people do. We don't judge them. If they don't believe in Jesus, they're judged already. We are called to judge people inside the church. That is biblical. That is accurate. We cannot judge people's hearts, but we can judge their fruit. Amen? So if your fruit doesn't line up with Scripture, that is a real problem. That is something that needs to be addressed, and true leaders will address this. We all need to hear the voice of God over the voice of Christian culture. Can I say that again? We all need to hear the voice of God over the voice of Christian culture because I guarantee you, I promise you, based on the teachings of God's word, Christian culture will always, always lie to you. They will always lead you astray. They are not from Jesus Christ. They are religion. They are an institution. They are a moralistic reality, but they are not of God. They are of Satan. This church does not believe in evangelicalism. We believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. We do not submit to the authority of Christian culture because guess what? They have none. But they sure act like they do. Wanting to put people under bondage and wanting you to listen to their voice instead of the voice of God. And that's what these four chairs have to represent. When you become Habakkuk, when you become that man or that woman that listens to the voice of God, You will be attacked. You will be persecuted. You will be sought after because you are exposing the evil of the status quo. Just wear these kind of clothes, talk this certain way, listen to this kind of music, be nice, but don't be kind because kindness means truth. We just want you to be nice. As soon as you mess that up, we will attack you. We will make you suffer. We will punish you. Do you understand the biggest threat to the kingdom of Christ are all the religious evangelicals of Bozeman and of Gallatin Valley. Do you understand that? That is all through Scripture. 
from Genesis to Revelation, the most people that are going to persecute you, attack you from list, for listening for the voice of God as Habakkuk did, are going to be the Pharisees and Sadducees. It will never change. Do the Pharisees and Sadducees of Gallatin Valley, and there are many, probably more than I've ever seen in all my travels in the United States and Canada and around the world. There's a more concentration of Pharisees and Sadducees here than I have seen in major cities. We are at war. Do you think that the Gallatin Valley wants preachers in their churches or do they want chaplains in their churches? Only chaplains. Because I'm going to be very clear. Chaplains are very nice people. They are the nicest people that you can have around. They will not confront you. They will not speak the truth of God. They will only speak that which is acceptable to the masses. But they are not of God. Truly, true preachers. I prefer, honestly, to be called a preacher than a pastor. Because it's heralding in the Hebrew and the Old Testament, and it's preaching in the New Testament. You are preaching the very word of God. You are proclaiming, thus saith the Lord. And when people hear, thus saith the Lord, do they respond typically very well to that? But if I'm a chaplain, I'm going to make you feel warm fuzzies every Sunday morning. I'm going to make you feel good about yourself. Is the purpose of these messages to make you feel good about yourself? Or is it to make you, what we just sang, see the beauty of Jesus Christ? So, by me not caring about your opinions, because why? And I told that to someone at a coffee shop two weeks ago, do you understand that God doesn't care about your opinions? It floored him. He was helping in a church plant here, and he was irate. When I said, do you believe God cares about your opinions? And I mentioned it last Sunday. It floored him, and he was furious. His face changed immediately. Evangelicals are concerned and believe that their opinions matter. I'm here to tell you and be very clear, your opinions and my opinions don't matter. It only matters what this book says. We rightly divide the word of God, not according to Christian status quo, but according to the beauty of Jesus Christ. Those are two different worlds. So what does a true visionary do? Well, we have to define what success is. What does success look like to you? What does success look like to God? Those are sometimes very different answers. For what God is saying to Habakkuk is beautiful. This is one of the most beautiful passages in all of Scripture. I will take my stand at my watch post. This, brothers and sisters, is the job for men. You are to be the watchman over God's church and over your family, over your marriage, over your children. He says, I station myself on the what? On the tower and look out to see what he will say to me. He is praying. He is interceding. He is waiting to hear the voice of God. That's the first chair. It is prayer. He is seeking the Lord. He is being a watchman, a spiritual man who is the priest in his duties to intercede and hear the voice of God and what I will answer concerning my complaint. He is bringing his complaint before God. Do you have any complaints that you need to bring before God? Because that's being honest. That's being truly bold and that's something that is pleasing to God. I have a complaint thinking about all the children that are being abducted and sexually abused around the world. It is a complaint, when will the Lord act regarding all these Satanists mutilating children's bodies after they do their ritual sacrifices over them? How long will this go on before all of these men and women are brought to justice? When will it stop? The transvestites are doing sexual dances in front of five-year-olds in public meeting places and in schools. Are those not complaints? Did not Habakkuk have great complaints over the oppression, what they were suffering through the Assyrians and soon to be the Babylonians? Yes, he did. That is not a blasphemous thing. That is not an irreverent thing. It is how God has designed our hearts and lives. 
Because if you are not honest with God, you will bury your false spirituality and you will live in utter total bitterness against God. God is not pleased with you if you are living a lie. Job was blatantly, bluntly, crudely honest with God because of the injustice being done to him and the suffering. He lost everything. Did Job Job spend the entire book complaining, yes or no? Yes, he did. And God rebuked him for four chapters almost. What was that rebuke for? Was it for his complaining or for was it not believing and understanding the magnitude and the glory and the greatness of God? That was the reason he was rebuked. But he was honest before God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, does God want you to be totally 100% honest before him? If you are not honest, you are a fake evangelical. You do not probably understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because real people will be real with God. Truly saved people will be honest with God and with other people. You and I need to understand the spiritual condition of this valley is one of the worst I've ever seen at my age at 47 years of age. It's one of the worst. Probably in this valley, I'm one one of the ones that have traveled the most and have been to church after church, year after year, city after city. State after state. And I'm telling you, this valley is probably one of the darkest and the most beautiful physically I've ever seen. The darkest spiritually, the most beautiful geographically. Do you understand the seriousness of what's happening? Do you understand the seriousness of the warfare that we're facing? Do you understand that if men are not the watchmen, are not receiving the vision from God, the wife and the children, the grandchildren will suffer greatly. Satan is after your marriage and he's after your children. He's after your grandchildren. He has a plan to destroy every single one of them. Do you know that? Well, Pastor Jerry, where's that in the Bible? Easy. Paul talks about it in Corinthians. He says, commands us not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. Not to be ignorant of Satan's plans. He doesn't want to just bother you. He doesn't want to just make your days miserable. He wants to destroy you. He hates you because he hates God. And then the Lord answered me, and this reminds us of a passage that after all of Habakkuk's suffering and of Israel's suffering in Zechariah 1.13, the Lord answered gracious and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. God is gracious in giving us an answer when we do not deserve an answer, do we? But God is comforting like he did Zechariah. He comforts Habakkuk with these words. And in Lamentations 3.26 Jeremiah says, it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. That waiting is not easy, is it? Psalm 27 says the same, to wait upon the Lord, and he will strengthen you. And the Lord answered me, write the vision. This is why I encourage everyone to write and keep a journal. You need to take all those things off in your mind and your heart, and you need to put them on paper to see them, as it says in the text, clearly. What is God speaking to me about? God is not the author of confusion. So if you are confused, it is not God's fault. It is your job to hear the vision that God has placed on your heart from the word of God. Make it plain and write it on tablets. Write it on tablets so he may run who reads it. That means everyone that reads it. This is the truth of God. We are to run, not be burned down and barely be able to walk because we feel like a thousand pounds are upon us. We are to run the Christian life, amen? But when you are burdened, you are weighted down, you are confused, your complaints go unanswered and unhealed, you will not run, you will struggle to get up out of the chair and walk and then to run. We are all in a major spiritual battle, are we not? That is why we need to write these things down. That's why, again, that picture is up on the wall. We, this year, 2023, Building a highway, what does that mean to rise up in leadership to take the, 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 the goal of obeying God and following his word, and it says, he who may run reads it, but the just, but, sorry, the just shall live by his faith. What does that mean? We're missing the word there, sorry. What does that mean, that he will live by faith? Sorry, this is going to be moved. It's over in the other line. New technology. It's cool, but it's still, we're still working out the kinks of it. 
For still the vision waits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. How many of you have been so frustrated by waiting and the answer never seems to come? All of us? Lord, I've been praying for this for five years, for 10 years, for 15 years. At this point, Lord, I'm have a hard time believing it will ever, ever happen. The vision waits for its appointed time. The man of vision waits for God to make the vision become a reality. 2 Peter 3.9 says this, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should perish reach or come to repentance. God's patience, wanting everyone to be saved, is why the answer seems delayed. The key word right here is this word. It seems slow. It seems delayed. Wait for it. That is Psalm 27 in a nutshell. Wait for the Lord. Is that easy to do? Is it easy to wait upon the Lord when you have deep, serious complaints Serious needs in your life that you are wanting the justice of God. You are wanting the answers from God and it does not come. Is that easy to wait on the Lord? The Lord has given us great encouragement. It will surely come. It will not delay. So there's two times. Heaven's time and human, my time. There is a big difference between the two, amen? God does not operate off of my time. He operates off of his time And his time is perfect, mine is not. The man of vision understands the vision is hurrying to be completed. He understands the vision is not slow, and he understands the vision will not be delayed. This should greatly encourage you to see the text, and what he's actually saying is, the vision is hurrying up to be completed. Does that encourage you? We think it seems very slow, painfully slow, and God is saying the vision is hurryingly going to happen. It is on speed. It is at full velocity. I do not have to worry about that, but the only reason I cannot seem, it does not seem to me that it's at full velocity is because I'm on my human time. I do not have the mind of God. I cannot see nor comprehend what God alone can see and comprehend. Some, however, will not accept the vision because of pride. That's why it goes uh, in verse 4, Behold, his soul is puffed up, It is not upright within him. In typical Hebrew poetry fashion, there is a direct contrast that is made in one single verse. The difference between the man who lives by righteousness, by faith, and the man who is prideful and is arrogant. And from this verse, in commentary by Dr. Paul Kleinhardt in German, translated in English, says this, All pride against God rests on self-deception. And the judgment has no other object with reference to his self-deception than to lay it open, whereby it is proved to be nothing. Consequently, its possessor falls to destruction. But the just will live, not by his pride, not at all by anything that is his own, but by the constancy of his faith resting upon God and his word. The use which the apostle makes of these three words, the just will live by faith, is found in Romans 1.17 and Galatians 3.11. It is authorized, since there is, as here, the antithesis, by which the idea brought in itself is distinctly sketched, is the haughty boast of his own power entangled in sin. What does this mean? What is the contrast? There's two kinds of people. The people that boast of their power, their influence, and their money, they trust in that versus those that trust in God alone and his promises. God promised that he would rescue Israel, that he would send a Messiah and God did, and God is. So the man of faith, the man of righteousness, the man of vision lives off of the promises found in this book because this book is a book of promises, amen? Do those in the church or outside the church, do they live off of the promises of God, the majority, or do they live off of their money and influences? If they're influential in the community, chances are they have a lot of money or power politically. They do not weld their influences based solely on the promises of God. They trust in greed. And the two men during this era that were famous for living in their greed and died that way were Nebuchadnezzar and also Belshazzar, 
his grandson. They lived off of greed. They did not live off the promises of God. Here's what's interesting. and Sadly, I forgot to read these two in the first service, but verse 5. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he is never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. That's personification. Who is it talking about? What is it talking about? Greed. Greed is as wide as Sheol. What does that mean? Greed is what produces all this death. Why are all the vaccines and why are they pushing everything? Because they make so much money. You listen to Bill Gates' interviews 20 plus years ago, and he had said, stated repeatedly, I thought I was investing and spending way too much in vaccines, and now I know there's no greater profit I could ever receive than to produce vaccines. That is recorded. You can look it up and search it on the internet. It was greed that developed the vices to kill mankind. It consumes all of the nations as one. It is the greed instead of being patient to wait on God to fulfill every single need that I have. Every injustice, God will resolve. That is my comfort and that is my assurance. But this pride, this greed, they all go hand in hand. This being puffed up, as in Hebrew, is what we would say being arrogant or prideful in English. Jonathan Edwards says this, remember that pride is the worst viper that is in the heart, the greatest disturber of the soul's peace and sweet communion with Christ. It was the first sin that ever was and lies lowest in the foundation of Satan's whole being and is the most difficulty rooted out and is the most hidden secret and deceitful of all lust and often creeps in insensibly into the midst of religion and sometimes under the disguise of humility. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to say to you that the religious elite of this city are probably the most arrogant people I've ever known in my life. Just like Jonathan Edwards says, they have a pretext of humility, but they are living in boastful arrogance and walking in rebellion against God. They are not hearing the voice of God. They are living alone to please man. Anyone in this city, anyone in the world that chooses to never please man is going to be targeted by the enemy and by the false Christian community every single time. You will always be in bondage, and especially you women need to hear me. You will always be in bondage, and you will make your husband and your children suffer if you continue to please people. There is no man or no woman that exists on planet Earth that can be free if he or she is still trying to please people. You will never please people. You will never make people content with you every single time, every single day of the year. It's impossible. So please, please be wise and stop trying. See, nice people try to please everyone. Kind people only please Jesus Christ. You are blessed, you are loved. The more I Fix my eyes on pleasing Christ. You will be blessed and ministered to through my life, even though you might not like it every time. But you will be blessed beyond measure. If my eyes are fixed on pleasing Christ, Christ will bless you through me. Just like he will bless you when you put your eyes on Christ, God will bless everyone else through you when you put your eyes on Christ. But you try to please people, you will suffer. And just like Proverbs teaches, the fear of man is a what? It's a snare. It is a snare. We can either trust in our money and influence and power and our friends and how well people think I am and how godly and and kind or nice people think I am. And that is a snare that will lead you down to boastful pride. It will lead you down to greed because it can never be enough. The applause of man by one man will never satisfy the soul because he will want thousands to applaud him. It is never ending. So right now you may have 5, 10, 20, 100 people that applaud your personality and your family and how good of a person you are. But they are not applauding the glory of Jesus Christ. They are not impressed with Jesus. They're impressed with you. And that is pretty serious, isn't it? That is moralism. That is religion. 
but it is not true Christianity. Here's the amazing thing. The second, one of the most beautiful passages also in Scripture, and all of Scripture is beautiful, but this really jumps and stands out. Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on the high places to the choir master with stringed instruments. God is your strength, brothers and sisters in Christ, not the fulfillment of your vision. If you are not fulfilled by God and God alone, his beauty, majesty, his strength, his comfort, his peace, his salvation, his joy, the vision being fulfilled will never satisfy you. So God makes us pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, to come and get on our knees, first men especially, to get on our knees and cry out to God and hear the voice of God how? We hear through the voice of God by praying and by rightly studying God's word listening to the voice of God, trusting in the promises of God, and not the world around us, especially the religious world. They will always lead you astray. And next comes with expectation. God is saying, I will bring it to pass. We are to pray like Ephesians 3.20. So think of this third chair as Ephesians 3.20. Of God who will do far greater than what we could ever think or imagine. That is an amazing promise of God, amen? This is the chair of expectation And lastly, the chair of fulfillment, God will bring it to pass. Leave the chair empty until God decides in his perfect timing to fulfill and fill that chair. Because I'm going to say it again. Do you want God to do things in your timing or do you want God to do things in his timing? Easier said than done, amen. Because when you're through the valley of the shadow of death, that pain is so finite, so sharp, and so piercing, you want God to please Please answer yesterday. If he did, this seeking him, this knowing him, this trusting in his promises, living by faith, being justified by faith, expecting God's power, seeing the glory of Christ through prayerful expectation would never happen. It would never become a reality in your life, and you would be the worse off for it. God is so gracious that he does not answer, he does not fulfill or fill this chair until everything is in place because God is a God of order, amen? Be careful that your soul is puffed up. There is no arrogancy worse than self-righteous Pharisees, Sadducees. Nothing exists worse than that. That's why Jesus rebuked them so sharply. I personally have a horrible reputation with the Pharisees and Sadducees in the Gallatin Valley. Are you pleased with that or not? Should that fill your heart with joy? that out of all the pastors I know, I have the worst reputation with the Pharisees and Sadducees, and I am proud of that by God's grace. Why are they so furious at me? And they are. Things happen more this week to show how furious they are at me. And they're doing bad things that are hurting people. You know why? Because they can't control me, and they can't control you. If they can control me, then they can get me, and then they can get to you. I stand in the way of them getting into you. And I hope you see that. Because their attacks continue. Why? Because they don't listen to the vision of God. They don't listen to God's word. They listen to the gossip and slander of each other. That's the voices. Those are the voices of Satan they listen to every day. I make a public declaration and proclamation that God is and will use this church to break the demonic, satanic bondage and hold over Bozeman and over Gallatin Valley. Because it is God's word, it is God's truth being boldly preached that will break it through the power of prayer and the Holy Spirit. It will one day be broken. Not in my timing, not in your timing, because I want it to happen years ago. It's going to happen in the timing and the perfect way that God wants it to happen And it's not going to be when we know. When we think, oh, yep, it's coming. I know. I know the vision will not tarry. I know that it's speeding to its course of completion. It will take place. 
That is that prayer of confidence. And if you don't have that confidence, you are not praying. God's not listening to your prayers. Honesty and boldness, confidence, that's what God listens to. He doesn't listen to spiritual prayers. Did you know that? God does not listen to your spiritual prayers. God listens to his word being prayed back to him. I need to know the Bible to be able to know how to pray. Lord, these are my complaints. King David had these complaints. Guess what? I do too. I feel the same way King David does. I feel the same way Ezekiel does, Daniel does, Habakkuk, Gideon. I feel the same way Moses did. Moses brought his complaints before the Lord. How can you give me these people? They're rebellious. How can I lead them? Was he complaining? So don't complain with one another or with me, please. Bring your complaints to God. I don't want your complaints. I'll be honest. I don't want to hear them. They're like stress the life out of me. And you don't want to hear mine either. Here's the amazing thing about God. He wants to hear them. He wants to hear the depths of the sorrows of your heart. And if you don't, you will be the most unhealthy person on planet Earth. Because God loves you so much, he wants you to pour out your soul unto him. And most are unwilling to do that. The soul is puffed up. It's not upright within him. It's a bad heart. But the righteous will live by faith. That is quoted in Galatians 3.11 by Paul and Romans 1.17 and by the author of Hebrews in 10.38. The just will live by faith. These are the promises of God and God alone. You can look at these chairs as pillars, as the four pillars. The praying without ceasing. The promises of God, trusting in his salvation alone. I am expectant that God will answer all of my prayers according to his goodness beyond what we could ever or I could ever think or imagine. In the time of fulfillment, it will come in God's perfect timing. This is the mark of a man or woman who lives by faith. And principally, this process is to be done by the men of the church. It is the men that God calls to lead, and feminism has destroyed the identity of what a real man looks like, and it's now called toxic masculinity, as I mentioned last week. You need to know Petra Bible Church, by God's grace and grace alone, will always be a super, super masculine church. God has hardwired men to be warriors and leaders. God has hardwired men to want to buy guns. And wives have no idea. My, my husband has 10 guns, and he says, honey, I absolutely have to buy this one. It's like you only have one trigger finger. How can you have more guns or need more guns? Women, just you'll never get it. But you should feel protected. Because God has created men to be warriors and to fight. And the church, the church has emasculated men. They are no longer men. That's why we live in a woke culture, because the men gave up. The men threw in the towel, and it started with the churches. It started with the pastors not being real men. Do you know during the Revolutionary War, the battalions, the platoons that were the bravest and that responded the quickest were the church members and the clergy. The men of the black cloth is what they were called, and they were the ones the British feared the most. Do you understand that? Do you know that about your history? It was the pastors that led the charge, and it was the pastors they went after because they were the bravest among the men. The church members that were faithful to church were the hardest for the British to defeat. History books, our secular history books, don't want you to know that. But why? Because they were men of convictions. God told Adam what they were to do, what he was to do in the garden, and administrating the land and working the land and he told Adam not to eat of the, free, the tree of, of good and evil. The woman was not even created yet. It was his job to be the spiritual leader and pastor, shepherd of her, and he failed. And the woman, ever since then, has struggled to be bitter against men. But the curse of God was that women will want to dominate over their husband, it means literally in Hebrew, rule over their husband, but 
God says, but he will rule over her. So if women try to be feminist in their marriage, God's judgment and curse is upon them. And when men are passive and they let the woman rule over them, they're in worse rebellion against God and his curse. It says, God, you said, but he will rule over you. Uh Uh-uh, God, I'm not going to obey you. I'm going to rebel against you. And so I'm going to let my wife take the leadership of our home. And God's hand is against him completely. And his kids will turn out and turn against God one day. It's just a matter of time. And the reason why so many kids struggle with homosexuality and lesbianism is because the father is not leading in the home, the mother is. You look at the research. You look at Dr. James Dobson, what he wrote about the psychology, how it will produce total sexual confusion to your children when the man doesn't lead in the home. You will see it time and time again happen, and guess when it starts to happen? Age five, the child begins to notice mom's ruling and not dad. And the child at age five starts exhibiting characteristic traits that are against his own sexual identity. It's proven time and time again. You can research it yourself. This is a crisis. This is a crisis in the church. And I heard a pastor visit, visit in Nicaragua. He said, yeah, he said, yeah, the husband is the head, but the woman is the neck and turns the head wherever she liked. And he meant it as a joke, but I knew it meant that he was a coward and his wife ruled his home. And I was not very happy with that joke. Because that's a blaspheme against God's order of creation, amen? It is a hard job to be a true priest of the home and to hear the vision of God and wait for it, respond, trusting in the promises of God, not the fact that I am a rich man or businessman, I'm so successful in life, that's what I'm going to rest on. Well, then you're a horrible leader of your family. And God's never going to speak to you because you're living in rebellion and your arrogancy and your pride and your greed. And I've been around millionaires, men with a lot of success in this world, with a lot of money, crying because they were so lost, had no identity, and felt like total failures. Men that have probably more money than everyone in this room combined. Yet they were broken, they were searching because they felt like they were not real men. They had been ripped to to shreds verbally. See, if a man is not going to be a real man, dear church, please understand this. Will he ever listen to the voice of God? Will he ever trust in the promises of God? Why would he? He just does whatever his wife tells him to do. He's not going to trust in God's promises. And those children, remember the three chairs of the the parents and the children in the third generation? They're not going to live in expectant hope of the promises of God being fulfilled. Well, it's just what mom said. Well, we got to do it because that's where mom wants to go. Hmm. There's no fulfillment of that vision, and the family is completely empty, void of the Holy Spirit for generations. Does that mean you don't give preference to the wife's desires? Absolutely not. A true leader is meek. Amen? And you can ask Tanya. You don't have to ask me. But if it's a question of, and I'm going to add this for light, lightheartedness because it's getting a bit intense, which is my fault. But if it's an option, I've used this illustration many times, if it's an option and you say, do you want to go to Mexican food or Italian, you leave the decision with your wife, men, right? That's what leadership does. You have her preference, but you let her decide. That's called loving leadership. It does not mean that you're handing over the authority of the household to your wife because she makes the last call on where you're going to go out to eat. That is loving leadership, amen? And I just know from experience you don't use that example in Nicaragua because they always respond the same. You go to both places. The evangelical world is destroying the church of Jesus Christ. It is hurting so many people that women are now controlling the churches by controlling the men of the churches. They're gossiping, they're slandering, they're being busybodies. But yet the man is still in the position of leadership, but he's not the real leader. Satan always operates clandestine. He always operates behind the curtains in the dark. When you don't see who the real leader is, God reveals the real leader way out open in front of millions of people, doesn't he? 
this is my leader. The stones come flying. Everyone knows who the real leader of God is because he gets constantly attacked, constantly maligned and accused. But Satan's leaders, the minions of Satan, you're not going to see them. They're clandestine. They operate behind the shadows, speaking lies to the people that are in positions of leadership but are not real leaders. They are cowards. The last time I checked in the book of Revelation in the list of people who will be thrown in the lake of fire were cowards. Does God take cowardice very serious or not? Enough that he puts him in the list of liars and perverts that are going to be thrown in the lake of fire. That's pretty serious. Men, you are called to be a true leader. Hear from the voice of God. Know the word of God. Respond to the word of God in prayer. Trust in the promises of God, not in your money, not in your influence, not in your personality, not anything else except Jesus Christ alone. He is to be your only hope and your trust. Those kind of men are rare. That's why God reduced numbers of Israel from 30,000 to 300, the warriors of Gideon, because God understood man cannot trust in himself. He will only trust in, in me alone. God wants a church of men that are Gideons. God doesn't want the numbers. He wants the heart. I can't do that for you. Men, I can't make you come up and go through this process all the way to the end and see God do an amazing work in and through you and through your family and through the influences you have in society. I can't make you do that. I can make that decision on my own to be that kind of man. But dear men, there are very, very few men that exhibit that. Most of them are dead. They're no longer alive. Sadly, there's more examples of real men in the secular world than there are in the so-called Christian world. And I've seen them, I read them, stuff I, I, I hear them say and they write, not even being believers, but it reflects the principles of God's word. It blows me away that no pastors are saying what they're saying. Men that are willing, they're not even saved. They have no assurance that they're going to die and go to heaven. And they are saying bold truths of God. Willing to risk their life. And pastors are not willing to even do that. Why? Because they're not really called by God. And they're probably not even truly born again. There is more hope for the men here that want to put their eyes on Christ and Christ alone. Than all the masters of divinity and PhD degrees and theology and Bible combined. Because knowledge does not make you pleasing to God. Faith makes you pleasing to God. I've yet to find a pastor I look up to in this valley, and I will say that publicly. Why do you think this church has come under so much attack? Because they know it. When their cowardice is exposed, it is painful. They will do everything to limit that exposure. And the things you people have suffered because of it are real. I've watched it. I've seen it. So you know, this has been going on for the past 30 years in this valley. The demons are real. The weight and what people are suffering is real. It takes real men to stand up and say, enough is enough. It's not going to be tolerated anymore. How do you do that? You become like Habakkuk. You bring those complaints before God. The oppression and the weight and what people are suffering here. You, you, you hear the voice of God. You, you, are, you are bringing your complaints before God. You are crying out to God. You are trusting in his promises. And you are waiting expectantly, as Psalm 27 says, that we are waited upon the Lord. He will strengthen us. And in his perfect timing, he will fulfill every single one of those prayers. That's how much God cares and that's how much God loves. But men, I want to ask you to please all stand up right now. Not anyone else but the men of this church. And I want you to decide 
If you are going to be one of Gideon's men, if you are going to make that decision to stand up for the truth of God over false Christianity, over false religion that is hurting and destroying people in this valley. You may not know what it's doing to people like I know with personal information. But people are suffering here because men have not stepped up to say no to the spiritual leaders who are abusing these people and saying, I will follow Jesus Christ. I will stand up to him. It's not going to just be Pastor Jared taking the stones. I'm going to take the stones as well because that's what men are called to do. Men are called to be warriors and warriors today, not tomorrow. And again, I cannot make that decision for you. But it's time that each of our men of this church stand up and saying, I will cry out to God. And if necessary, however many times, I will get on my knees and cry out to God for my wife and for my children and for this world, this society, this state that is so corrupt and people are so lost. They have what Paul said to Timothy, a form of godliness, but they deny its power. A form of godliness, but they deny its power. God is not again interested in numbers. He is interested in your heart. The abuses are real. Men, I must ask you, are you going to stand up to these spiritual abuses? Are you going to be passive and do nothing? Because that's typically what most men are called to do by society. Step down. Don't do anything. But when you climb higher in that mountain, that oxygen is going to get thinner, isn't it? You're going to feel that deprivation. You're going to feel that confusion that high altitude brings. You can feel dizzy, lightheaded until you sustain yourself and you go back down and you go back up and you acclimatize and you climb higher and higher and higher until you reach that summit. That's God's calling for each and every one of you because if men don't stand up, Satan wins. But as Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He made the decision, not his wife. He made the decision, not his children. Your children don't know what they need. You do know what they need. You know what the Bible says. You know what they need. You don't listen to them. You tell them, thus saith the Lord. This is what you need in your life, and I'm going to pray that it happens. And every time I've talked to my children, and sometimes they do fight, no, Dad, you don't know. No, Dad, this is that and the other, and give me reasons or excuses. When you're 30, I'll listen to you. Until then, I'm not listening. And then later, a week, sometimes just a couple days, Dad, you're right. I'm sorry. I should have listened to you. Dads have to take a lot of abuses from everyone. Husbands have to take a lot of abuses. Leaders, pastors have to take a lot of abuses. Because that's the calling of men. To take that weight and to carry that torch and say that I will live for Christ and I will be that example. My life doesn't matter. I must decrease so that Christ increases, John 3.30. I, again, cannot make that decision for each of you. You must make it. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday. It doesn't matter your passivity yesterday. That is gone. That is history. That is all under the blood of, of Christ. Amen? That shame, that guilt is gone by the blood of Jesus if you're truly born again. You make a decision now. I will live for Christ and Christ alone. My children need me. My wife needs me. And men, we are super fragile, are we not? And wives, you probably may not understand this, but understand this as a man. That cowardice is always at the door trying to creep in and take me over. And every time you must say no. I'm going to stand up for what's right. And when I stand up for what's right, I know those stones are going to come. And they're going to come with the violence but I'm going to do what's right no matter what. And your spiritual authority, men, depends on your living a life of faith in the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ. It does not come with a pastor's title. It does not come with a master's divinity degree or a PhD in Bible theology. That is not the spiritual authority. The authority is a heart completely surrendered to Jesus Christ, completely sold on the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is your spiritual authority. It is time for these bishops to be done with over this city. We are not Catholics. We are born-again believers, amen? Enough of these false spiritual leaders over Gallatin Valley. I am done with it because they are not of God. 
And every time it was the minute, the minor, the small that preached against the big, against the major, against the evil, corrupt leaders and rulers. It was always the minute number that spoke out against the masses of the numbers of the people, the leaders over those people that were destroying the lives and blindly leading people into hell. And such it is with this church, the minority. Will you make that decision to be a man of faith and stand up against the evils that are happening? Because they're not just evils out there. In other states, in other cities, in other other lands, they are here in this valley. And they are destroying people's hearts and lives. Men, do you care about what's happening in this valley? Do you want to see God bring salvation to this valley? Are you going to stand with me? And are you going to stand with our church against those forces of evil? You need to make that decision. Because I'm going no matter what, with or without you. Because I know what God has placed upon my heart. I will go alone. Just like I went to Nicaragua alone. Just like I faced things overseas alone. I will Fight it alone, because I'm not alone. Because Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, God the Father of the universe is with me. But it's so much better with a full army, isn't it? So much more powerful. They will crucify me. They will. Eventually, they'll wear us down so much. They will do it. Can't crucify a whole church. You stand up in unity. They can't fight against that. They will try to divide and break up the unity of the body of Christ. When they cannot, they will shudder. They will flee. They will back down. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I pray that, Lord, the men of our church would stand up. That the men of our church would do what's right no matter what. That, Father, we are called to receive the vision from you, Lord. To do that which is right and follow the leaders, the anointed leaders you have put into place. Father, we know that we are not up to this task on our own power, own ability. We are fragile men. But Lord, you are our strength and you are our power. You are our fortress, our refuge, our peace, our hope, our joy, our strength. You give the battle cry and we are to respond, Lord. We are no longer to be passive. We are not by, to sit idly by while people are suffering. While these abuses are going on. We're going to say enough is enough. I'm going to stand with Pastor Jared. I'm going to stand with Petra Bible Church. I'm going to be a warrior of Jesus Christ, that people know the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they do not know religion, that they know Jesus as Lord and Savior, that they are broken and humble and repentful sinners. They understand what they've been saved from. They're not in power control trips. They do not have a form of godliness but deny its power. There are people truly who understand the power of God unto salvation. Oh Lord, only you can do this work in our church. Only you can bring these destructive, Lord, evangelical cultures and false religion and false spiritual leaders. Only you can expose them, Father. I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord that you destroy the wicked enemies and the demons and the control over this valley. I pray by the blood of Jesus, you destroy the Satanists and the witches that are here, that you would raise up godly men and women. You protect our children. Lord, more and more violent people are entering into Bozeman. And Lord, we know more and more crime is on the increase incredibly in this place that never thought it would happen. It's happening. And Lord, it's time for the church to stand up. It's time for the men to say, Pastor Jared, what can I do to help? I stand with you. And though we are just a church plant, it doesn't matter. We are mighty and strong in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We will not allow the liars to continue. We will not allow the accusers to go on. We will stand firm. We will stand strong. We will pray. We will get on our knees. We will not let Pastor Jared and Tanya go through this alone. We will not others let others go through this alone. We will stand with them in prayer and in solitude and in unity of the Spirit. That, Father, by faith we will see this break one day in this land. Lord, it will happen. You will destroy the works of Satan in this valley. Father, you are preparing the way. You are building that highway. 
Lord, keep us close to you. Keep us walking in humility. Keep us focused on you. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Thank you so much for watching Petra Bible Church Bozeman. We will have a new sermon uploaded each week for both English and Spanish services. And remember, hit like and subscribe. Thank you and God bless.